Hello, you beautiful little marketing bees. You're tuning into episode 87 of the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is the Marketing Buzzword Podcast, the podcast where we dissect the world's most common marketing buzzwords. Hold on tight. We are about to fly around the beehive to see the latest buzzwords that stuck to the marketing bees. Hello again, and welcome back to the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is the podcast which helps you to understand what all these business and marketing buzzwords actually mean and how they can be helpful or not going forward. I'm your host, Ben Roberts, and in this show, I'm the marketing bee in charge of making sure I can get on the right guests and ask the right questions to make sure that these words and phrases actually make sense. And in today's show, we're going to make sense of the buzzword localization. And the idea of actually not just translating stuff, but actually being really local. Before we get into it though, I need to let you know this podcast is powered by Talkative. Talkative is a company that brings together live web chat, voice calling, video calling, and co-browsing together in one package embedded into your websites. No downloads or plugins for your customers, and allows you to capture a lot more customer data, which which in turn allows you to be able to provide a more exceptional customer service and everything is saved straight into your CRM. So you don't have to really worry about the faff and the frills and trying to record everything and make special notes. It can all be saved, transcripts and all. Check it out at talkative.uk. And one final thing before we get on to this week's guest. If you are loving the show, please feel free to leave a review on iTunes and join the Marketing Worker Bees Facebook group. Right, that's more enough about me. It's time to introduce this week's guest. Now, this week's guest is a really, really cool person. So she's called Ellen. So Ellen de Visser is a multilingual Berlin-based entrepreneur from the Netherlands. She speaks seven languages through living in six countries and connecting with locals and helps businesses do the same with her translation agency, Access East. Her company provides language services and has an extra big range of Eastern European and Central Asian languages. Besides running her own companies, Ellen is one of the head organisers of the Language Influencer Summit, an influencer marketing conference, and enjoys public speaking. This month she spoke at TEDx Wolverhampton and TEDx uh, Plovdiv, which I assume I've got that right. And over the last year she spoke about entrepreneurship, languages, and intercultural marketing at conferences around the world. From Silicon Valley to TEDx, and then to the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. Really, really excited to share this this episode about localization with you. So, that's more than from me. Let's get on with the show. Hi, Ellen, and welcome to the podcast. Hi. Hey, how are you today? Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm excited to be on the, the Buzzword Podcast, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be really interesting. And today so we're talking about localization. That's our buzzword of of the session. So let's yeah. let's get straight into it, Ellen. What on earth is localization and why is it important or do you think it's important for businesses to understand localization? Yes. So I think in order to understand localization, um I think we should know the difference between translation and localization. Um, so in this whole translation industry, there's so many, like a, a pair of, like a bunch of buzzwords. There's also transcreation and internationalization and stuff. And um, but I think for marketing, localization is the most important. So basically, as you know, like translation is um, just translating a sentence into another language. Like you, you're not looking at culture, whether something is. Uh, maybe offending in another culture or like you, you change like the metric uh, like symbols in another language but then localization does that so basically localization uh, localizes um, a specific text uh, like makes it ready for an, a specific country or region so um, yeah this could be like specific colors in, in, a, in a document or on a photo or um really um yeah specializing in on a specific country so if you would translate for example a technical manual then you would change uh like yeah metric symbols from the uk system to the us system or 
European or that that kind of stuff. So you really look at the specific culture and specific country and what kind of specific stuff there is, and you apply that uh, to your new translation. So it kind of goes beyond translating words on its own. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, isn't it? Because we look at business from the perspective of, okay, look, we need to, uh, we want to expand our business. So we could be a, a small, a small, medium, or large business. We want to expand territories. We're we're a globalized world. We we there is yeah. it, it's. I mean, you can run a one-man social media agency and have clients in like eight different countries. There, there's absolutely nothing stopping that at all. So I guess now we look at this and go, people go, oh. I'm going to be lo- I'm going to localize to that area. I'm going to write I'm going to have my website translated into German. Mm. For example, and I'm going to write some blog posts about social media in Berlin, for example. But there in mind, they they could be based in Bristol in the UK. So it's like yeah. so how would someone und- how would someone understand the culture in that? So instead of just translating their website into German, how would mm-hmm. they act- how would that actually fit into understanding the culture and actually creating um, and actually, lo- like truly localizing, like you said, around sort of how everything fits, the words, the feel, the the way in which people operate. It's not just about actually the uh, the literal translation. It's about actually how it all fits together. So, how does all that work? Um, so, first, I think uh, because you said you were talking about um, blog posts. Of course, if you translate something in English into German, the text might be longer. So you have to look on your website whether that fits so that's also part of website localization that you look uh also like with a arabic, arabic or something that text is totally different somewhere in, in another place on the website and um yeah you really need to think about especially marketing how things come across you know in, in england we have very different humor than in germany and what kind of uh headlines would you use to to catch people's attention um there are some certain like yeah jokes that that may not work in germany and um yeah just um yes ways of phrasing like um or like sayings that that would not work here that would perfectly work in england so how, how are you going to deal with that and i think if, you, if you're if you a small company and you don't have the money to hire a German yourself to, to look at it, at least it's very important to know what the difference is between localization and translation. So if you would um, work with an agency that you can directly say, hey, I need this service because I want to uh, get this message across to that particular audience. Because, you know, if you, you're translating some manual, you don't need to think about culture really it's more like the information itself but if you're a marketeer you really want to get people's attention in another country in another uh uh yeah cultural field i guess yeah that makes a lot makes a lot of sense isn't it because obviously there are things that that there are ways in which you're saying things again you say like the german humor is actually very different from from british humor and you go to different parts of the world that where they're just small subtleties, but they actually make a mm. massive, massive difference. And it's actually yeah. quite hard for people to understand. Again, you don't have the same... The way, the way you, you've almost got to think about, I guess, in a way that you wouldn't literally translate word for word what someone was saying mm. in a different exactly. country. You try and understand the context of it and actually how it all fits because you try and read people, whereas actually you've got to understand actually there's, there's more than just the literal word that isn't localization localization is the understanding of the culture um, and how it all fits together and i think a, gr- a brilliant example of this a, a company a large company that we all know i think an example would be mcdonald's i mean i'm pretty sure if you go to mcdonald's in any different country there's different things on the menus there's different recipes that they'll use there's different mm-hmm. ways in which it's, it's not just literally having big mac <laughs> in in like a hundred and something different languages they literally have different menus with different options depending on where you are and i think things t- taste slightly differently as well because in the uk mm-hmm. they'll have british beef whereas they go to america it tastes like american beef and and these little <laughs> things like that that is more localization than actually than just translating stuff because it would have been easy for them just to translate stuff but that's not what it is yeah i guess you can you can see it like that like that's a good comparison <laughs> um oh god my, my mic was a bit funny there. <laughs> um so then if we're looking at this how could 
how can businesses op operate then on a, on, a, on a level of localization? Is it a case of, do you have to be operating, living within that city in order to truly localize? Do you have to have a presence in that city? Or can actually businesses become, have a, uh, create a sense of localization without actually being in the city at all. So, for example, um, say you, I, I, I'm a Bristol-based, a Bristol-based mm. worker, but actually I want to do a lot. I do a lot of stuff in Cardiff, for example. So, for those of you who don't understand the difference here, that's probably about an hour, an hour and a bit's drive. So it's not necessarily easy, but it's it's not quick and easy. So I may not have a presence in there, but I want to target stuff that's around, say, Cardiff, or want to target stuff for London. Let's use London because London's a much bigger mm -hmm. example. Yeah. <laughs> now, how can you localize if in in London because it's a bigger pool of talent and businesses and money? as opposed to Bristol. So mm -hmm. how, how would you be localised in London if you don't actually live in London, if that makes sense? Um, that's a good question. So say you have some campaign that you want to start in London. Of course, I think um, you could do that with humour. Like you can find out what the latest trends in London are or like what people really are, are a lot of really annoyed about in London. And then you could maybe um, like catch that in like with humor and then um um that's a really good question like you could really say something about the city or like um yeah that particular environment that people live in you can you can look at that and see how you can implement that specific thing into your your text or, or campaign uh yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, the, I think what it sounds like then one of the key things that we could do if we're looking at to localize in different areas. So we're obviously we're based in somewhere else, but we're trying to do a really localized campaign in a different city. Is it, it ultimately it takes a lot of research and local knowledge. So by the sounds of it, then it's it's tapping up what 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 people, industries, businesses are working in there. What do they work on at the moment? What what are, what are people talking about in that city at the moment? And that's how we create localization. Actually spending time actually researching and guess that's the difference again between translation and localization localization is a lot of actually pre-work whereas translation is literally just changing something later whereas by the sounds of it in localization there's a lot more pre-work we have to do there's a lot more we have to think about in terms of actually do how we even set up the campaigns from the from the start. So I know there was a there was something recently. I think it might have been Coca Cola in New Zealand or something where they trans literally translated something, but it actually to say hello in like in like the local um, uh, Maori language, but it actually translated to something completely different. It's that lack of understanding of the thing because they, they didn't necessarily do all that pre-work they just literally did the after work which is a translation mm -hmm. so basically besides translation and localization um, we were talking already a bit about trans creation so that's really um, looking at the needs of this specific region or country and really um, creating a campaign from scratch so for example the, the example I always give is if you would um, do something in the summer, you know, with uh, the World Cup, or you would like start in America with, you have some Super Bowl campaign or something, and then if you would localize it into, let's say, you go to Spain, and then you would change it to World Cup, but then if you want to transcreate this, um, like transcreation goes a step further, so it's more that you then look for something specific within Spain, some specific event that you can build your campaign around. But the thing is, um, you know, all these words, all these buzzwords, they, they kind of overlap with, it, with each other. Like, um, for example, when I was uh, at the university, I studied German and French, and I had some translation classes as well. And even within, if you have a good translator within this translation process, they already do some sort of localization. So you could say, you know, where is the, where is the boundary between localization and translation or localization and, and transcreation? It's just, if you want to work with an agency or hire someone to do this localization for your translation, translation I think it's just important then that you know for yourselves to what certain extent do I want to adapt this to your target audience? Um, and they will do the rest for you, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot because I think 
it's an understanding and this is what I guess what part of this podcast tries to do is not only just break down and try and demystify what some of these buzzwords are but actually try and sort of help it all fit together and again it's trying to understand how actually this transcreation thing like um, works with localization translation actually how they all fit in together so through localization you want to transcreate so you want to create the campaigns that are highly localized and then translation fits into that in terms of actually making sure the words actually fit together because sometimes the literal translations just don't work and you have to think rethink the campaign because it just doesn't work in a different language because there's not the same is literally not a translatable word or it the, the sentence the sentence when it translates just doesn't actually make make sense you might need to as a business understand that just because you're even even going from different parts of europe for example there are words and phrases this europe's a is a is a great example i think across europe because there's mm-hmm. so the cultures are so great and the barriers are so there but it's also really wealthy so it's really difficult to sometimes translate and use diff- you can't just use like a european campaign you almost mm-hmm. need to use almost like different thing different and even regional campaigns i mean yeah, you yeah. just look at in Eng- england and the uk the amount the diversity in terms of even just not saying even languages so we could even almost take out translation from this in terms of a UK sense because yeah. the amount of diversity you have in terms of cultures and dialects mm-hmm. is thing. you speak to a Cockney who sounds completely different to a Brummie who sounds different to, to a Scouser sounds different to yeah. someone from South Wales mm-hmm. and they all say and use different terms so what you could make a you could make a campaign that's around sort of um you could say why I and that would make sense in Newcastle but it wouldn't make sense anywhere else in the uk yeah. <laughs> and that's that's localization i guess versus translation then you transcreate for for the for the geordies you 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 could potentially do a campaign around to say why i is, is is that what is that am i on the right sort of track there Ellen? um yeah i think you can see translation localization and transcreation as like three levels of the same servers so eventually this is all about creating like um yeah kind of creating or like putting uh, your message from one language into the other um but then each one of them goes one step further than the other so yeah the translation is just basically only only translating the words and maybe changing a little bit so that it makes sense and then localization is more specialized and then this translation is like more free and it's more f- like free translation really specialized in this region um yeah <laughs> yeah so does um if you were to hire a translator would you would you expect them to have an idea of localization and have them understand the culture or would you expect them to just be able to translate and again can you also or should you also hire people purely on the basis of helping you understand uh, local cultures should how should it all fit together should you get should you create the campaign yourself and then tr- get translated how should the pros how should the process work and who should be sort of responsible for what should you take localization on as your thing and then just you know, translate it just literally translates or should should you expect a translator to do that how does a, if you're trying to create a, a localized campaign who should be yeah. responsible for what and how does it all fit together yeah so first of all if you you decide to to work with a translator, I think it's very important that you find out uh, if you, you're in touch with a translator, what kind of uh, in what field this person is specialized. Because of course, there's medical translators and technical translators, and they might have like less knowledge of marketing and uh, like target audiences. And um, I think it's very important that if you start, if you want to to go abroad and start a campaign somewhere else, that you work together with a marketing translator because that person probably knows better how to they, they they can think better of your target audience and your your from a business perspective how 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 it all works and then um of course depending on how big your company is or, or how big the campaign is you want to be i think if you're a small company then it just it's enough to probably just work with a translator a marketing translator to just localize localize this campaign because as a marketing translator like you already think about your target this target audience and how how things will come across so i think 
as a marketing translator, you already have it, like the localization is already kind of in there. That's why I also said before, like translation localization is a bit, there's this much overlap in there. Um, but of, of course, like if you've, if you, if you have enough budget and you want to do big campaigns, of course, it would make sense to hire someone uh, from Germany or something that can consult you on what kind of trends are going on in the country or what kind of what, what would work well. And um, you could just send your text to your normal, like a general translator, and then the, the German in your team could modify it, perhaps because you know, if if you hire people, they they know your the vision of your company better and like what kind of message you want to get across. So it really depends, I guess, on your budget and how how big your campaign is and what you would like to to do and to achieve in what kind of uh, what time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that makes a lot of sense because I guess it's they it they, there is no one size fits all approach and it's trying mm. to work out how. Like um, I guess, I guess it all depends on the unique businesses that we're running and the types of campaigns. Because again, you could have if you have a bigger campaign which has, um, which has a numerous stakeholders, it, it, it makes much more sense to have that sort of division of labour. Um, it makes so much more sense to have um, different people responsible for different things. Whereas actually, you have a, whereas actually when you get bigger, it's trying to work out who is responsible for what. So I think it's a really interesting point you made there, Alan, about actually how we would potentially build out. Um, a campaign and who is sort of who how it would all fit together mm-hmm. um so one of the other things then that i want to ask you then is what sort of examples could you provide for businesses from a maybe a service point of view and maybe a product mm-hmm. point of view of where localization um comes in and where it, it sort of works absolutely brilliantly from a, one from maybe one from a service point of view and one from a product point of view if you if you can um so i remember working together with an agency and it was for some phone brand and they they had this summer campaign about you know with pool parties and stuff and it was all very american like the whole concept of pool party and when you, you localize or try to create this campaign, you have to think about, you know, pool parties, that's not really something we do in Europe. Like we, we know it from films and stuff, but we we would rather go to house parties or like other, like go to the lake together or the, the sea or whatever. I don't think that this concept of pool parties is as big as in the US as is here. So even this kind of small concept that you would normally wouldn't think about that it would make such a big difference. But um, if you change them, people really can identify more with this, the setting in which it, in which it is. And for example, the campaign was about then, you know, it was a waterproof or something and then it would fall into the pool, or like it, it would get wet during the pool party, then um, it would be a problem. But then, yeah, you have to change this whole concept um, so that it really fits into the the I guess general European culture or like UK culture. That makes a lot of sense because again, yeah, we see it on the films and we and it's quite easy for people to be sucked into this Americanization where they go, oh, we're we we're, we're talking about pool parties, talking about frat parties, we're doing uh, mm. the spring break. There's all these things yeah, that you exactly. see. There's all these things that you you see quite a lot mentioned in. Um, yeah in films and tv programs because because american programming is is extremely popular and it's fine but people need to know that that actually necessarily isn't isn't real life and actually that doesn't translate so talking of trans- oh carry on oh sorry no go on, <laughs> go on. You know, like black, black friday that that got so much um more popular right now like over the years and that you see in europe that people are beginning to to use that for for their marketing campaigns as well so i think it's really just looking at the trends and what can you use what can't you use and i think what you localize maybe changes over time or like stuff you have localized changes and you have to localize it or those, those kind of cultural concepts or, or trends yeah, definitely. Um, and something else that, 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 from what you've said, I want to sort of maybe dive dive deeper in on is is actually individual communications because we talked about sort of localization from a a sort of a more mass market point of view in terms of businesses and campaigns. 
Now, yeah. how should business, how should individuals within businesses view localization, and how can they ensure that they're actually, um, actually adhering to local customs, and when they're actually messaging people for the first time? Because I see uh, there are people that message me from different parts of the world on LinkedIn and stuff, and they don't. It 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 just doesn't work. It's not in. <laughs> And it's like how do how do people address localization from uh, an individual uh, individual to individual point of view? Oh, so, so you mean if you so like yeah, you're mess you're, uh, you're email you're some... you're emailing someone who's from a different culture. You're having conversations yeah. with people. There's the subtleties in terms of how people communicate, the way in which we so uh, I guess British people are usually quite a bit more prim and proper, or, or, so to speak, okay. or, or where there's these sort of they're less um, uh, ballsy, I guess is the word we use. Whereas Americans, it would be straight up down the bit, maybe a bit more down the line, stereotypically. When mm-hmm. and there are different cultures where there are different ways and means of doing business or having conversations yeah, okay. with people, which aren't necessarily always acceptable in mm-hmm. other cultures. So, how would people understand those differences, and how would they go about trying to address them or trying to improve their localization from a individual messaging point of view? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um... Yeah, I think I have a good example there because, you know, I'm, I'm Dutch and we are sometimes perceived by other coaches that we are a bit rude. And I think that's a very, like, we are very informal and um, I live here in Berlin and Germany have some German customers who are quite old fashioned, I would say. And, you know, sometimes that, that doesn't entirely work. Like, I feel awkward being so formal to people when I do business with them or like there's these hierarchies and, and, um, so I guess, you know, I, I found this out after a couple, like, uh, you know, after a couple of months emailing with these people. So I guess it's just try on error, I guess. Like you, you, I think you, the more you, you're in touch with difficulties, the more you get this sense of what, what is acceptable and what is not and how people deal with each other. For example, I have a really nice example. Um, so I'm working with this, um, with this man from this company for like three three years now and I've been providing him with Dutch translations and you know in Germany um, with tra- more traditional like family companies uh, which he has it's it all goes very slow so like in Germany it's very important that you build trust and like business relationship are really built around trust and it takes a really long time to establish and um now, after three years, I got invited to his uh, company's Christmas dinner, and that was that's a really big thing, like in like the, in this German business yeah. relationship. <laughs> it was like the next step, and I felt, yeah, I felt like okay, now we finally have an established relationship. And I felt like after that, when I came visit him sometimes to, to the office, that things were a bit less formal, and you know things started to get more relaxed. And I think. In Holland, that would have happened maybe after a year or something, or like things are a bit go a bit fast in that sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I like I like, I like that example because yeah. it's it's where localization is really by by actually really diving into that culture and actually even though it's difficult by actually really understanding that culture, you've actually been able to have some real. Um, positive benefits from it so it's not necessarily always easy because you go from a, a laid back to culture to one where it's a bit more stern faced a bit more a bit more old school and then going to these things and actually by actually by embracing that culture you generally get more results but it is harder work and people love to take the easy road on some of this yeah. stuff but actually the easy road actually isn't always going to yield the best results just because you may get in contact with more people you may be able to have slightly more conversations but actually it doesn't mean that actually the quality of conversations is going to be any good or that you're actually going to build that rapport because localization builds rapport rapport builds business and actually just because you translate or you can speak a language if you can't understand the context then it doesn't make a lot of sense mm-hmm Hmm, that's really interesting. So, um, from where where do people often get things wrong then in terms of localization? So, sort of to wrap this up then is mm-hmm. how do people often get it wrong, and what steps can they take to to actually to to be more localized in terms of an international bit a business that inter, that can take and and work with businesses all around the world? How can how can people do that, and what mistakes should they avoid? Mm-hmm. 
I think the biggest mistake is just not localized at all. Like I think if you go into other markets, you should always consider other cultures and um, even in, within these cultures, they're like subcultures. So like what kind of uh, audience am I targeting? You know, um, I really think about that and how to implement that in your campaign or, or um, uh, website. Um, and then I think if you're like a complete beginner, I think if you you have lived abroad a lot, like for a long time or something, that it, it could be easy to then just use stereotypes or something. So I think maybe that like, of course, everyone knows that, but I think um, that's also a thing to avoid. And because it mostly all comes down to subtleties. Um, and then what, sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> no, no, that, 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 that was it. It's just stuff, stuff to avoid, really, in terms mm-hmm. of making sure that I think that stereotypes is a really, it's a really, really good point to make, and one that I'm, I'm so glad you said because obviously it's really easy. Again, like we said earlier, it's really easy to stereotype. It's really easy to do the basic things because it's mm-hmm. it's simple. It's actually understanding things. It's going, okay, French people, they all love baguettes. German yeah. <laughs> German people. Oh, they all love sauerkraut. Oh, Romanian people. Oh, Romanian. They're either they're either vampires or gypsies. It, yeah. the, it, 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 it's it's one of those things that the they they're often they're not correct. Sometimes there's even potential racist or uh, xenophobic connotations, which people don't necessarily understand because they've always just oh someone said that to them once when they were younger and they didn't understand it, so they've just used that term. And it's yeah. trying to understand, and that that is, I think, is one of the most dangerous things of localization when people use stereotypes in order to try and build uh, localized campaigns around. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, is example, there anything else? Also, um, um, maybe an example of that is, you know, in Holland we celebrate Saint Nicholas, and that's like very traditional. We we celebrated for like hundreds of years, and um, but now American influence is so big that a lot of people don't celebrate Saint Nicholas anymore, but they celebrate like Santa Claus and like all Christmas and St. Nicholas is at the beginning of December. So I think if you do the St. Nicholas campaign, um, like that would be quite stereotypical. Like if you would forget that St. Nicholas is at the beginning of the month and then do it later on or something, I think that that would be a mistake um, that like that could happen if you only think in stereotypes, Oh, this is tradition, this country, then um, that might work, but not not all people do it, of course. Yeah, I love that idea because I know that in Germany, in Saint Nicholas was was a, at least was a big thing. Anyway, I don't know anymore. Again, and that's one of those again. It'd be easy for me to make that stereotype, and I don't know if it's still the same thing in Germany because I know they used to put like is it like bits of things in shoes or something in Germany? Is it something to do with Saint Nicholas or? Yeah, in Holland we do that. Yeah, <laughs> but again, everyone in everyone in over in Netherlands wears clogs, don't they? Because and they all they, they, they all love flowers. It's, it's it's easy to make those stereotypes. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Thanks so much for your time today, Alan. I think it's been really interesting to sort of think about localization. Actually, a lot of the intricacies, and I think that's one of the big things I've taken from this is actually localization is a lot of intricacies, and it's a lot of time up front to really understand and it, localization isn't isn't easy and it's one of the things if you really want to have a more localized business or work on a localized in a localized way you have to really spend the time to understand and there's not really many shortcuts you can take from localization because from a business point of view we've worked in whatever uh and in every whichever country we've been in for a while we've immersed ourselves in it so trying to work in a different country that you don't live or work in it's really hard to understand that culture so you have to work really hard in order to be able to to become or at least be seen as a as a localized business within or create a localized campaign within that region um yeah i guess shortcuts would of course be just ask someone in your network who has lived in that country or or um speaks that language whether that thing your campaign would come across well or like whether there are things they would change or like other maybe trends that would apply much better or of course just work together with an agency or um yeah hire someone from that country um yeah i think that's the way to go (laughs) oh definitely so brilliant thanks so much for your time today alan but before i let you go (laughs) before i let you go though you thought you might have got away with this but i'm going to have to ask you the one (laughs) 
The one question that I ask everyone at the end of each of these podcast episodes. So it's Ellen. What is any other marketing buzzword right now? Are you loving or hating? What is what something that's really grinding your gears and go, people, please stop using this term, word, or phrase, or something, or something that you're absolutely loving right now? A term or phrase you're using quite a lot. Um, yeah. So the one I saw on your your podcast before was FOMO, and I I just I think it just sounds so funny. <laughs> I really like it. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So true in, in today's world that everyone has this fear of missing out. Um, so it's something I hate. I think if I, you know, if I hear words, then I, I'm like, oh, I hate that word. But from the top of my head, I, I couldn't <laughs> make any, honestly. Or like smart cities or something like big data, those kind of verse verse that get used all the time. I really hate that. That's I'm not sure that's really marketing, but um. yeah, no, no, uh, I make, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. I think with FOMO, I think it's an interesting one because obviously we live in this experience, this world of the experience economy, and everything's about creating experiences and trying to get more people to do more stuff and make it seem things seem like they're either better than they are or things seem make people want to want it more and spend that time and people want to be special. People want to be have things that aren't aren't readily available for everyone they want to sort of have that limited thing so uh yeah i think fomo is a, is a, is a great one to to sort of look at i think i think it's really interesting and maybe um a word i hate i'm not sure entirely if that's marketing as well but synergy oh I yes find it's such a strange word we've had a, we've, <laughs> we've had a few we've had a few people come on and say synergies across the uh, oh. so you're, you're definitely not alone in that one <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dale, and it's been an absolute it's pleasure. And I know there'll be so much value about localization that people will get from this episode. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I love from this show looking at the difference between localization and translation and trying to find actually how business can truly localize or how businesses who are not necessarily based in, in, in a region are able to actually maximize the local opportunities of localization because localization really makes a big difference. It really helps people to understand. It really helps you to resonate with that market. It really helps you reduce the risks that actually entering new markets can take. And in a globalized world, we want we need to take those risks. We want to open up new markets. We shouldn't necessarily be restricting ourselves to a a small localized area. We can do. But it doesn't mean we should or feel like we're forced to, to work within just our city demographic or our local area. And I love the advice that Ellen gave about actually trying to understand that if you are moving into a different area, it's not about just translating. It's about actually understanding the cultural fit, the language fit, the the rules, the societal impressions that things give. Actually, just, just even the tastes. So we use the McDonald's answer, example. Absolutely, absolutely love that. I think it's something that we don't necessarily always think about enough. And we see a huge number of times where big brands get it wrong. And I'm sure small brands do too. So it just obviously has less um, less newsworthy status. So hopefully you've got something out of this localization episode. Because I really have. And I'm really, really excited to hear your thoughts about it. So please, if you did enjoy the show, please do leave a review on iTunes and visit marketingbuzzword.com for more information and insights. Um, also remember to drop me an email to ben at ben-m-roberts.com if you have any other guest suggestions or just want to have a chat with me about certain stuff or use, just find me Ben M. Roberts anywhere on social, anywhere online. Google me Ben M. Roberts and you'll find more. Thank you very much for listening. I'll be back next week with another guest episode. Goodbye. This podcast is part of the You Are The Media Network.